So now we've looked at the spectrometer, we've looked at fluorescence, we've looked at all the different aspects of the Raman. Let's look at the data now that comes off of these and talk just a little bit about interpretation of that data. The shorthand uh, spectral interp. The first thing, and I said this in the very first video that we, we started with in this sequence, is to realize that Raman, just like infrared, is a vibrational technique. It's looking at that transition between two energy levels. Remember, in IR, we get there directly. In Raman, we get there indirectly. But in the end, we're still in that same energy level. So understand that if you know how to interpret a infrared spectrum, a lot of the same tools will be useful here. A carbon-carbon stretch or a carbon-hydrogen stretch that occurs at 3,000 wave numbers will occur at 3,000 wave numbers in the Raman as well. Ester peak, 1750, Raman or IR. Uh, one peak will be more intense than the other because of the selection rules, the difference in the selection rules between the two. But in the end, the locations of the peak in relative wave numbers is what matters. Now, just briefly to touch on that, remember you've got the Rayleigh line. And I'm going to draw them going this way. And then you have a series of peaks. So this is my Rayleigh line. And that Rayleigh line occurs at nu r equals nu L. It's occurring at the frequency of the laser. Okay. Now this Raman peak right here, which is a Stokes shifted peak, is occurring at nu Stokes equals nu laser minus nu, and in this case we'll call it, well we call it zero to one. Let's keep that nomenclature from earlier. So that's my transitional energy for that first vibrational level. Now, we don't plot it this way, though, because remember, this is like, just for simplicity, let's say that the, the laser frequency is 20,000 wave numbers, okay? If the vibrational frequency is 1,000 wave numbers, that means the scattered photon, the Stokes scattered photon, is going to be at 19,000. 20,000 minus 1,000, 19,000. When we chart this, when we put the plot on the screen, we do something called Raman shift. What that is, is we know the laser frequency. The laser frequency is input. When I was a graduate student, we were using the argon ion laser, the frequency of the 488 laser was 20492.4 wave numbers. I remember that number after all these years because I used it all the time. And the green line at 514 was 19436 wave numbers. Again, you started out with those numbers here. So 20492.4, if this is at 1,000, then the peak would appear at 19, etc. It would be at 19,000, whatever that difference is. Okay? So you would, you would see that peak at 19,000. But what we do is we actually do the math when we do the plot. We flip it over. So we solve this equation and we will say nu zero one is equal to nu laser minus nu Stokes. These are the two. We know this. This is measured. We do the math. We actually plot it so that now this becomes zero and your wave numbers are going this way, say at 1,000, 2,000, etc., up to 4,000. That's exactly what you remember from the infrared. That's how an infrared spectrum is plotted. Flip it around, you got an infrared. This is what's called Raman shift. Okay? That Raman shift is what we're plotting. Now, another piece of Raman that is quite interesting is how sensitive the Raman shift is to local environment of the molecule. So that if you take a molecule, and let's take as a good example, the carbonyl mode of a, 
Well, let's make it simple, acetone. So you have the acetone molecule, and you look at that vibrational mode right there. If you take and look at that vibrational mode, you'll get a single peak for it. If you add water to the peak, or water, excuse me, to the acetone, that peak shifts. Why? Because the water molecule hydrogen bonds to that carbonyl mode. When it does that, when it bonds to it, it actually increases the mass of that mode. It lowers the energy in essence, and it downshifts. So adding water to the carbon, to the carbonyl mode, to the acetone, adding water to the acetone will cause the carbonyl peak to shift to lower frequency. It's very environmentally sensitive. Another example of that is that Raman, and I'll just draw this as a schematic, we won't worry about details, but this right here and this right here are in-groups. They're the in-groups of that molecule, and the in-groups are very susceptible to IR. So the in-groups are pro probed by IR. Whereas the groups in the middle, right here, the backbone, is probed by Raman. This has to do with the difference in the selection rules. The fact that IR is more sensitive to change in dipole, the Raman is more sensitive to a change in polarizability. There isn't much dipole change when that backbone moves. The Raman is sensitive to that. When the in-groups change, vibrate, whatever, there isn't much change in the polarizability because a lot of the electrons are buried in that backbone, but there's a big change in the dipole. So you see the in-groups in the IR, the backbone in Raman. That's a general rule for polymer analysis. There's a lot more to this um, interpretation question. There are entire books written about the interpretation of Raman and infrared spectra, so I'm not going to even begin to try and do that here. But I did want to touch on the idea, first of all, how we plot the data, how does it look on the screen, and then finally talk just a little bit to the idea of uh, the fact that it's environmentally sensitive. This is really nifty when you're like putting a molecule onto a surface and you see shifting of the Raman. Um, an example, getting back to something we mentioned a few moments uh, in one of the earlier videos, was the idea of um, uh, carbon nanotubes. When you have a single wall, a double wall, or a multi-layer graphene, single layer graphene, double layer graphene, higher orders layers of graphene, the peaks in those spectra shift and actually show those changes. Silicon, when it goes from a highly structured crystalline material, it has a sharp peak. As it goes from that crystalline to an amorphous, the peak broadens and shifts. This is all about that sensitivity to the environment that Raman gives you. So as you're looking at the Raman data, don't just look for the, the big trends, the big peaks and and uh, like a spectral interpretation, uh, you know, a search result. There's more subtle things in there that can tell you a lot more about the neighborhood, the environment of your molecules. So Raman and infrared both give you a lot of that data, but Raman gives you a little bit more, including with the uh, polarization, the fact that you can see the VV and the VH, the difference between those two, and they can tell you a lot about the symmetry, about the alignment in the local environment, the alignment of a backbone material such as this on a surface, the alignment of carbon nanotubes. As the carbon nanotubes are laid down on a surface, they can either be aligned or random. If they're aligned, then the polarization shows a strong bias. If they're random, then the polarization shows essentially the equivalent scattering in the two dimensions. So all of that just gives you some idea about the interpretation. There are lots of videos included here that can help with more with that. And again, if you have questions, please feel free to send us a question. Thank you for listening.